Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. Welcome to episode 163 of the Garden DC podcast. In this episode, we chat with Michael Perry, also known as Mr. Plant Geek, all about plant geekiness and his must-have plant picks. The plant profile is on Nine Bark, and we share what's going on in the garden, as well as some upcoming local gardening events in the What's New segment. We close out with a last word on the joy of apple picking, by Christy Page at the Food Gardening Network. This episode, we're joined by Michael Perry, a.k.a. Mr. Plant Geek. He is the co-host of the Plant Based Podcast, and he is joining us all the way from the UK. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me onto this award-winning podcast. Thank you for joining us, <laughs> and thanks for bringing up the award. I can always uh, talk about that for a long time, but we're going to focus on you and plant geekiness and all the great plants that you've been seeing and that might be coming to our gardens sometime soon, we hope, yeah. and all those fun things we can be adding to it. And um, let's talk a minute about you and your background, and of course, on the Garden DC podcast, we like to ask our guests, were they born with a green thumb and chlorophyll in their veins? Uh Absolutely. So much so that I I can't imagine what else I could do as a career. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like I would be good at anything else. Uh, I had a short spell as a vet, kind of as a vet's assistant, but I didn't really like the operation. So no, Uh it was all plans for me. But yeah, ever since I was a kid, gardening with my grandparents, it really gave me the bug and I just wanted to to always do more and I really loved it from that young age and really I'm so happy to have the opportunity to build a career around something that is also my passion and I'm aware that not everyone gets to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah Yeah, it's so great to make your passion what you do for your living and I love that you called back to your grandparents and that experience because I think Mm -hmm. a lot of us gardeners have somebody who mentored us in our background right? Definitely. For me, my grandparents, you know, I, I often think like because when you're a kid, you, you spend a lot of nice time with your grandparents. When you're with your parents, maybe they're nagging you or <laughs> telling you off about this or that. But always the fun stuff is with your grandparents. And I do wonder if they weren't interested in plants, if it was maybe cooking, would I now be a chef, for example? So mm-hmm. it does make me think because When I was young, obviously, they were gardening. They were exhibiting dahlias, chrysanthemums at the local flower shows. They were also judges at flower shows as well. So I was really kind of shadowing them. And soon I took over my parents' garden. Uh, In those days, it wasn't cool to love plants. So I didn't tell my school friends about this. But Mm -hmm. yeah, I kept all this secret until um, leaving school at 16 to go to Horticultural College, which was a stroke of luck. Because there's a horticultural college in the county that I lived in uh, in Suffolk in the UK as well. So, again, if that hadn't been there, it was kind of a lot of things that fell into place. And then when I started work at Thompson & Morgan, this was also in my home county as well. So kind of I feel very fortunate that all the things that were there ready for me to work with. Otherwise, I don't know what options I would have had, really. Because hmm. I was well, very shy in those days, you know. Yeah. And it sounds like almost like destiny or serendipity that you Mm. had those local resources there, but probably not coincidence, right? No, no, definitely not, I would say. But yeah, I feel really, just really thankful for that. Mm. Mm. And can you describe where you're gardening now and the conditions that you grow in? Yeah. So I've got a house in Suffolk in in, in my hometown and I really garden there on a kind of awkward clay like soil it's quite a small garden so kind of like postage stamp size but i i feel like uh sometimes having a larger garden would terrify me because mm-hmm. this is actually really easy to manage um it was originally lawn and a pathway and a border which is kind of the layout for most gardens in the uk which is 
really quite dull, I would say. Uh, so I ripped that out straight away, made the whole garden into a big border and basically put some polished concrete kind of pads in the middle. So then the borders are full, buxom and billowing with plants that spill over onto those uh, concrete pads. And, you know, great for pollinators, kind of a really, really nice kind of slightly sheltered environment as well. Mm. One half of the garden is distinctly shade. The other half is distinctly sun. So it gives me two areas to kind of play with. Uh, I planted some nice big birch trees in the middle, which might outgrow their space quicker than I imagined, but I'll deal with that at some point. <laughs> and there's a big sycamore that was there originally too. And I did uh, planted like a kind of big hedge at the bottom, Prunus lusitanica, the Portuguese laurel. And that was a lesson I learned because I planted very big plants, but they actually took about two years to actually start growing and establish themselves. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't buy big again. I'd probably buy whips something that is kind of younger ready to roll so yeah it's it's still developing but it's it's a test ground as well because I'm often you know like you I'm sure I'm often given new plants to trial and test and so I'm happy to edit the garden from time to time let's just say that mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah and I love that you use the word buxom I always mm -hmm. say that my garden is a jungle yeah. <laughs> for that same full stuff full of everything imaginable not much order to it on, on my side of things but on your side of things it sounds like you're a little bit better about editing just because it's maybe a little bit smaller space and you have to be yeah yeah definitely and kind of I'm not maybe I'm not too scared to throw a plant away because it's still mm -hmm. good compost you know <laughs> Yep. It's all organic matter that adds back yeah. in. Or pass it on to a friend. You know, I've got so many, you know, I've always got so many plants in front of me that it becomes less novel sometimes. It's kind of, oh, more plants. Where am I going to put them? You know, but I've got so many friends who are kind of so appreciative of it. So there's never, never a plant that doesn't have a home somewhere in the neighborhood. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so you were mentioning uh, your clay soil and for the local listeners here in the mid-Atlantic U.S. and and year all around the world, what would you say your USDA equivalent growing zone is? Would you be a zone eight mm. in our system? I think that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Getting down to, well, getting into minus, but not that often. Minus five, probably max, I would mm -hmm. say. Yeah. Yep. Does that sound in line? Yeah. Yeah, and you probably can, we're about zone six, seven, mm -hmm. predominantly seven in the mid-Atlantic, and there's a few areas bordering on eight, you okay. know, a few, but they're they're able to grow things like actual get a full pomegranate by the end of the season would be more oh, wow. of an eight, um, you know, at the end, like maybe mm. by November. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so, so, but probably similar conditions but i'm guessing your winters are probably a tad milder yeah but still unpredictable i mean last year it was down to minus 10 for mm, quite scary. a long period of cold as well so i think that kind of fluctuation hasn't made plants happy in the last few years as well mm -mm. did you lose any plants during that cold spell yeah, I mean, I'd been a bit tardy in bringing some kind of succulents in, which is kind of very foolish. I was not expecting them to be hardy by any means. But um, I think a lot of people did lose quite surprising things like uh, cordylines, uh, mm -hmm. hippies as well. And uh, someone said to me, I think from the RHS, that it wasn't necessarily the cold, but it was the fact that it had been very hot that summer. Mm -hmm. And the plants were really kind of confused of like they... I think they'd thought it was maybe spring when it was hot because it had got hot after it was cold or I can't remember the science behind it, but there is some. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that the summer stress is probably yeah. was, was part of the impact. Mm. And yeah, same thing here. We had an early cold snap in October and yeah. we usually don't have our first frost sometimes till late December. Uh, so really? that caught yeah. a lot of plants unaware, especially in like the Tennessee Valley and that part yeah. of the U S that ah. they just lost a lot of woody plants that just, you know, really? were not prepped you know, they yeah. weren't even thinking of going into the fall yet. So they weren't even yeah. dropping down their sugars or anything at that point. Oh, oh yeah. But I mean, on on some level, it's kind of, it's been good for the industry because it's been buying a mm -hmm. lot of plants. <laughs> I exactly. Look at it, but it kind of helped the industry, which was nice because, mm -hmm. 
you know, very often, like in UK, people want plants to last forever, which is not great for the ongoing, you know, production. <laughs> Especially with bedding plants, they want everything to flower for eight months of the year. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. Yeah, of course you want a bargain and yeah. and you want things to last. But then the novelty is always fun too. Yeah, definitely. Yep. And, you know, eventually some things die and some things are short lived at the start. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned cordelines and for us that is very marginal in the mid Atlantic. There are a few people who grow them, I think, in containers, but probably winter them over inside Mm -hmm. in a greenhouse. But they can kind of push the season. We call it zone pushing or zone busting Mm -hmm. when you're trying to go for the next zone eight or nine um, and trying it, you know, taking taking a chance. But that chance can also um, come back and bite you. Okay. (laughs) Hmm. Are you doing any zone busting or zone pushing with plants in your garden that you're like, I shouldn't be able to have this one, but I am? Uh, Maybe only accidentally. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I think there's, uh, I've got a kind of almost like a living wall that I planted up with some crazy kind of cactus and succulents last year. And that just stayed on the wall in the winter. And some of those have actually fared quite well because there's the Seamus Paris uh, cactus, which they've recently started promoting in Europe as a rock cactus, one that you can indeed, you know, just grow in rock gardens. And of course, Mm. the problem in UK is always that things just sit wet in the winter. It's not necessarily that it's cold, but it's the fact that they just sit there with a wet bum for months on end that the plants don't enjoy. Mm -hmm. So if the plant has good drainage and is cold, it kind of generally generally could live through and and some of those cactus were not doing too badly actually until that really sharp one so yeah Mm -hmm. I guess that was a kind of wild experiment but they're they're mostly through kind of maybe uh forgetting or getting too busy because it's it's also hard to manage a gun when you are then traveling a lot and kind of I'm not necessarily doing everything at the right time or giving it as much attention as I should but then you might say you know a garden needs to look after itself as well because that is nature so it's kind of uh yeah, somewhere in between. Mm-hmm. I always call that laissez-faire, survival of the fittest. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> kind of like if it was meant to live, it'll live because it's yeah. not getting much inter uh, session from me at that point. So being yeah. a lazy gardener or absentee gardener in a lot of cases as well. Uh. Mm-hmm. And that definitely shows you which are the toughest and which are the most prone to survive in your mm. area with it without too much interference. Yeah, so, totally. Um, so we're titling this episode Plant Geekiness or Plant Geeks because mm-hmm. um, we just came back a few weeks ago from a meeting of what I would term as hardcore plant geeks. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the GardenCom annual meeting conference of garden communicators that was held in Minneapolis this year. And so many of those people are coming from horticultural backgrounds. Some of them, like myself, are coming from a journalism background. Mm -hmm. And others are just there because they just want to be immersed in gardening. (laughs) What a good place to do it as well. It was it was really cool. And I have to say, even before we talk about the plant element of the trip, Mm -hmm. being at an American conference just It just made me feel so confident, full of joy, positive, because you guys, you're the kings of networking, honestly. You know, on on the bus, when we were like moving around after the different stops, this is, Mm -hmm. you wouldn't do this in Europe. This is not a thing in Europe. Everyone's kind of wants to sit in their same spot and kind of is not really mixing in this way. But like you guys, it was almost like you you kind of had an uh, like internal bingo card and you just wanted to meet everyone. Mm-hmm. And it's just, I love that. And it feels very alien to me in Europe that you would do that. But it's a brilliant thing. And it was just such a positive atmosphere. And it's a real credit to, to you guys as a nation, perhaps. But yeah, did, did you realize how unique that can be? <laughs> yeah, I didn't think it was so unique. But now that I think about it, I used to literally when the list of attendees was printed out and put yeah. in our kits and not just sent as an Excel sheet or something. I would go down every night and check off the people I talked to that day to make wow. sure to see how many that's how obsessive I was. I was like, Oh, I didn't meet this person yet. Or I didn't meet that person. So yeah, I think that's a little bit on the American side of things. It's great, though, because that's how you build connections, you know, mm-hmm. 
Yeah. No, I was very impressed with that. But yeah, sorry, that's not even about plants. <laughs> no, that's how you get to know plant people. And exactly. yeah, exactly. and they're so friendly and generous. I find most gardeners are very open to talk yeah. about plants and gardening. I guess it's a nice product we're dealing with, isn't it? So it's mm-hmm. going to be yeah. uplifting anyway. Yeah. It's positive. It's green. It's growing. It's not, you know, it's not the the stock market mm. <laughs> or something. <laughs> It's a little bit more fun. So let's talk for a few minutes about what you saw on that trip that you found of interest, and then we'll transition to some of the upcoming plant previews that you've been uh, sure. privy to. Well, first of all, I was seeing interesting things even inside the hotel mm. because the learning opportunities from this Garden Com event were just amazing. And I don't feel we have anything comparable in the UK, even even in Europe, perhaps. You know, the the seminars, you know, mm-hmm. talking about AI, uh, talking about, you know, accuracy in the age of social influencing, kind of wilding, uh, the flawns, the flowering lawns. That was really cool. It's all really well researched, very progressive, very kind of uh, very forward thinking. And it's just really, really impressive. And so even inside those four walls, I was really, really excited. Uh, outside the four walls, we obviously went out and about to different gardens I was very uh, excited about how they use shade plants in particular. Very inspiring. Very jealous you can grow such lovely hostas as well. But then Mm -hmm. I I hear that deer is your enemy, whereas slugs and snails would be I. Yes. Yeah. I would say the Midwest, when I was in Indianapolis and Mm -hmm. in Chicago and Minnesota, those are some huge, impressive, gorgeous hosta. But yeah, deer pressure is the enemy of those hosta. (laughs) <laughs> so that was great and um i don't remember which garden it was but the one where uh there was a lot of hosta and a lot of a very small violet that had this foliage like uh cyclamen that was really cool and there were so many textures there and it showed you it was almost 50 shades of green it was mm-hmm. a really really interesting textured garden um i enjoyed heidi's garden with the edimentals you know all the edibles kind of in the front garden goji berries with lovely crops just on the front border and also i really enjoyed the kind of uh uh the juxtaposition of her garden filled with plants that were useful and her neighbor's garden that was just a kind of lawn and nothing and this is almost how my garden is at home back in Mm -hmm. Suffolk because i've got plants uh, plants for pollinators all over the front garden my parents say it's a jungle here and i'm (laughs) like well when you look at the neighbor's garden, which which one is better for the wildlife and the environment? I think probably my jungle rather than the paved garden next door. So, but it's it takes a lot. And I and I did um I asked Heidi how she could be so brave to have such a you know a buxom, we'll use that word again, garden <laughs> against her neighbors that don't work like this. And it's kind of like it really is it's hard to bust through because my neighbors just think my garden's a mess, but it's great for wildlife, you know? So Mm -hmm. that was an eye opener as well. I enjoyed going around the garden centers. Really, really interesting. Tonkadale, for example, excellent houseplant range. And I've been watching their social media since, and they're very, they just got a very nice, relaxed, fun attitude running through the whole company. And that was quite inspiring as well. So that was a very nice trip. Um, Gosh, we visited so many places in a short space of time. It was brilliant. I loved it, though. Even just walking around the city, seeing how the planting is there, you know, how you use lovely street begonias, canna as well. Coleus. We are not into coleus the way that we should be in the UK. But Mm. you guys really are. Yeah, you use them to great effect. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of coleus myself. They're so Mm. easy, so easy to propagate, you know, such a great range of colors and combinations. Mm -hmm. And I refuse to use the new Latin for them. Don't even start on that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But yeah, great for shade. And then we have all the new breeding for sun coleus as well. So it's great to see. And I agree with you. We saw so many great gardens and garden centers and just walking around downtown Minneapolis. They just, do such a great job with their street plantings it's mm. it's a beautiful city mm-hmm. um, of course they get the benefit of in the winter time heavy snow coverage and it all kind of washes away and then start with a blank canvas again right uh-huh. yeah 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 absolutely mm. <laughs> all right so let's start talking about 
some of those plants on the horizon or maybe that you've had a little sneak peek of that you're excited about and maybe we'll start by doing it by category so Hmm. how about annuals to start maybe a few favorite annuals coming down the pike well i've just been this week uh in cambridgeshire in the uk to the curly family they breed um i don't know if you know petunia priscilla which is Quite a well-known one in Europe. It's a double-flowered, sugary, fragrant variety of petunia. Mm. It's gorgeous. And they um, have selected a lot of doubles over the years. Very vintage, gorgeous colors. A lot of uh, Piketty's and kind of vein varieties too. And they really are the, the petunia experts. And and looking across their breeding, there was a lot that I couldn't take pictures of. wasn't allowed. But really, petunias, I can't believe there are still new colors new shades there was terracottas there was peachy there was kind of bringing petunias with calabracoa as well which gives Mm -hmm. you the uh the pet coas and so this gives you a whole different color palette but also a strength in the bloom as well so a lot working in petunias and and very interesting they're selecting ones and I, i i learned this phrase with them called layering they want a petunia that will layer and what that means is the the first kind of the first uh, flowering period of the petunia, once that fades, by the time that fades, there's another layer almost appearing above the faded layer. So you actually never really have any dead flowers because they're always covered over by new blooms. And that is kind of layering. And that is a way that they like to select their new varieties. So lots of cool things there. They're also selecting calendulas for hanging baskets with quite small flowers, almost anemone flowered. They're very interesting. Um, I love a retro plant, though. A plant that hasn't had any work, but I think should be revived, is Salpi Glossis. And they were actually on show from Flora Nova at a recent Dutch convention I went to. They're related to petunias, but they're uh, a lot taller. They've got a lot more veins. I used to grow them from seed with my grandma. They are amazing border plants. So they need a bit more love. But of course, there's a lot happening uh, in Holland from Van Hamer in particular and Sahin. With cosmos, there are cosmos that mm. are outside our wildest dreams these days. When I was when I was first working in Thompson and Morgan and looking through the kind of foreign seed catalogs, I used to salivate over a variety of cosmos called Yellow Garden, and it was always in the Japanese Mayoshi catalog. And I was like, why can we never have a yellow cosmos? And then 25, 30 years later, we have yellow, we have peach, we have sunset tones. It is beautiful. But there's another angle with Cosmos that is about to come, and that is the atrosanguineous types, the the chocolate Cosmos. There is some new types coming through from Wetmans in the UK that have spidery flowers, that have a kind of blush pink flower. And there's also one that has a flower that is twice the size of a usual chocolate Cosmos, and it's in hot pink. It's amazing. Oh, my gosh. And with that lovely chocolatey fragrance as well, it's just incredible plant. Mm. That sounds fabulous. And yeah, I love the pet koas that are coming on the market mm. now. They're a little bit smaller flower and I like that they're self-shedding. So yeah. one of the, one of the great things about them is very low maintenance. Remember those old fashioned petunias? I remember going out in my grandmother's garden and having to pinch off yeah. the spent blooms and the scent would just be sickly after a while to me. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, I call them kind of the... What do I used to call them? The non-stick petunia. Mm-hmm. That's what I call a pet coa, definitely. But this <laughs> actually, interestingly, from a Syngenta, I believe, there's a series of petunias called the Itsy series. And these actually have flowers the same size as Calabrocoa because sometimes Calabrocoa can be a little bit sensitive in different types of soil. Mm-hmm. So actually, they've developed a petunia that has all the same credentials, but not that kind of Calabrocoa look because, you know, sometimes it's still still a bit alien for the consumer sometimes they want them still to look like a petunia like with a uh, busy lizzie's like new guinea types like some mm-hmm. patterns never really caught on because people wanted them to look like the typical wallariana types so yeah it's kind of um i guess it's like uh nostalgia a little bit you kind of want to grow the things that your grandma used to grow because you you know you can rely on them they're familiar as well so yeah it's uh it's really interesting how we how we buy plants and how we how we accept new ones into our fold as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's always that market that, you know, every year they're going to buy the same red geraniums, the same Dracaena, Mm. and then put that in their front boxes or whatever. 
and then maybe something will catch their eye, like some of those new pet koas or the hanging calendulas, and maybe they'll experiment a little with those. Mm, definitely. I think there's so many colors across those whole series as well, you know, and what they keep developing is just, yeah, I can't believe it. <laughs> mm. Well, I'm excited to try out those cosmos, especially if I can get my mm. hands on some seeds. That will be really nice to have in a cut flower garden. Yeah, I think most of those would actually be coming through veg pop, but I I will need to check because I know um, because some of that breeding comes back from Thompson and Morgan when I was there. Mm -hmm. And one of the uh, kind of aims was to get a chocolate cosmos, the normal one from seed, because it's not it's not that common and not that reliable as well. But I think mm -hmm. these pink ones are probably veg prop, but they're such a wow factor. Honestly, they're really, really cool. <laughs> mm. Well, turning to the perennials yes. and I know this is a huge category so we'll maybe narrow it down to maybe three to five mm -hmm. so something that we're starting to turn our heads to is newer lavenders in this country because a lot of people traditionally grow hidka and hidka is kind of not really the best performing lavender mm -hmm. but again it's got that familiar name so a lot of people then get it because they're they heard their parents mention hidka as a good one you know like this and and it doesn't perform as well as Exceptional, um, different varieties like this. Exceptional is actually from Lloyd Traven, who's a US breeder who you'll probably know. Mm -hmm. um, so they've got, uh, what's the other one? Sensational, that's another one. And then there's a third one as well. Uh, phenomenal, oh, yeah, Sensational. Phenomenal, exceptional, Sensational. Yep. The one. Yeah, so <laughs> great words, huh? Mm -hmm. And then, but they really do what they say on the tin because these are really strong these are great in our slightly moist climate over the winter as well. And with really good perfumes that are kind of close to close to Grosso, which is that really good one that is selected for perfumes. So I would say lavender. Another plant that is really, really come up through the ranks. And it used to be a plant I just grew with my grandma, kind of a random plant that was just in the garden. Alstroemeria, Peruvian lilies. Mm. The intercanches, the dwarf ones, are amazing. And these are comparable to any bedding plant as well. They flower for five months of the year. They're covered in color. They're so easy to grow. They're so durable as well. And they, they multiply really easily. Some of the taller ones will give you maybe 100 cut flower stems through the season as well. So the exotic flowers are almost like orchids too. So Alstroemeria, so hmm. easy but exotic. So, Love Michael, that. are you growing those, uh, getting them from bulbs or corms, or how are they uh, well, sold? It, and... it varies. Mostly these days it would be from plugs, so hmm. kind of uh, from Micropop. But I know that at Thompson Morgan we used to buy the tubers from uh, some suppliers in France. Mm -hmm. There is different ways to grow them, but some of the newer ones are – probably best grown by Microprop or they're probably grown that way because uh, they can uh, charge a nicer price for it. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that too. But yeah, for us, Alstroemeria is a supermarket cut flower plant. I don't know if that's yeah. the same in the UK. Everybody is used to just buying it and it has such a long vase life, mm. like weeks and weeks but that it will last. But the that rich. They're mm -hmm. always the pale colors that I don't enjoy. And I love the oranges, the reds. Yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, and the fact that it can be garden grown, I think it would be a surprise for a lot of people. But I've, I have oh, seen yeah. it in public gardens in our area doing well. Ah, that's cool. But yeah, any type of soil, sun, partial shade. So that's quite a flexible plant. Huh. Uh, I want to mention iris, actually. Whenever someone asks me my favorite plant, I always say iris because mm. it's such a varied family. There's probably an iris for every month of the year, uh, an iris for every part of the garden as well, if you think about it, too. This year at Chelsea Flower Show, we had a lovely garden that um, I wanted to win uh, viewer's choice, but it didn't. And this was, a, it, it was almost like a watercolor painting. And it included a lot of very historical iris in the most non-colors you can imagine. They were kind of like bronze and wishy-washy colors, but they were really a work of art. Really, really gorgeous. So there's a lot more eyes on bearded iris in particular. I just wish they flowered for more than like uh, 10 days or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, 
the, yeah, oh, there's yeah. there's a few reblooming irises that rebloom yeah. for us in the fall, but they're not the ones you're talking about. Those tall, tawny colored brown yeah. ranges in general. And yeah, those dark ones as well. But mm. interestingly, the reblooming ones. I remember selling those when I did uh, put together some of the plant catalogs at Thompson Morgan. Probably about oh my god. 20 years ago now <laughs> you suddenly realize how old you are when you have to work out dates <laughs> like that Sheesh. um but this uh, the reblooming ones were popular then but i haven't seen them around in europe for a few years and something else this might shock you something we don't grow enough of is hemicallis daylilies what now no. i'm very shocked yeah so especially with a warmer climate i would think people would jump on those honestly mm -hmm. i don't see them for toffee honestly yeah that's interesting because, yeah, daylily selecting and breeding as a yeah. home hobby is very big here. Um, yeah. So I, I work with a lot of daylily society people mm. and iris society. And, you know, a lot of them are the same. They'll have both, yeah. both daylily and iris in their garden and uh -huh. maybe also a hosta collection. Those yeah. tend to go hand in hand with plant geeks and collectors who <laughs> love to love to dabble with getting Absolutely. the newest variety, getting crosses done. And daylilies are one of the easiest to do if you want to yeah. try out, you know, to create a flower on your own. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's really cool. Really, um, something that you don't see as much these days is encouraging home breeders. And when I was uh, working at Thompson Morgan, we took a lot of home breeding varieties in over the years. Hmm. And I remember uh, working on leaflet ones to show people how to breed plants. But I think I think we need a TikToker to take that on. <laughs> yeah, people. that's yeah. a great idea, Michael. I think some yeah. demonstration of you yeah. know, putting the little, collecting the seeds from the daylily. It's really all, yeah. to me, It's the trick is the labeling. Because I am yeah. so bad about that. It's like, what cross did you make? I don't know. It came out. <laughs> uh, have you, you've made some of your own hybrids then? Yeah, I just like fooled around with putting one flower to another flower, but and then see what results. Yeah. But, you know, nothing that I would, you know, share or introduce yeah. just for fun. One of my first jobs at Thompson Morgan, I did kind of experience different parts of the company. And one of the first roles was actually to hybridize uh, the Bascoms, I think it was. Yeah, in the breeding location. So I've done a little bit of that in the past. But um, you're looking for a, a fifth suggestion. Have I done four or three? I'm not sure. I've lost count, Michael, but oh, go well, ahead. Well, I'll, just, I'll give you one more in that case. Um, sure. Ooh, where do we go? Maybe GMs. GMs. Mm. There's a lot in GMs now. At Chelsea, uh, Chelsea Flower Show Plant of the Year, in the final 20 was a GM called Orange Pumpkin which was a double flowered dwarf variety comparable to a marigold, actually. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, I grew one. I don't know if it performed as well as I expected, but certainly in GM, there are many, many interesting varieties. To, I think the taller ones kind of fit there nicer because they kind of, they're a bit wispy. They work in the border nicely uh, alongside Verbena benariensis, for example. So mm. yeah, GMs are really having a moment and uh, heucheras as well. But Hucca is for, for lovely flowers as well as amazing foliage mm. as well, all at the same time. Yeah, I just love hookahs and all the foliage. But yeah, I mean, I let my flower stems just go and I just keep keep them. But I do know a lot of people who mm. trim those off and I think that's a shame. Oh, uh, no, no. I Well, interestingly, with hostas, we would usually trim hosta flowers off. But you guys see that as the part of the feature, don't you? Mm-hmm. Especially some of the older ones, like the plantain lilies, the mm -hmm. the kind of almost the straight species, so to speak. And I have cardinals that come to my garden and strip the seed heads off of the hostas. So I leave them all oh. those all those seeds oh. up for them. That's really interesting because they they also like some of those like more traditional plantain lily ones. They the flower is held so far above the foliage that it kind of looks weirdly out of proportion as well, <laughs> which I always true. find funny. And I'm like. <laughs> In UK, they would never bear that. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't bother me. But I'm I'm all about this the fragrance, and because uh -huh. yes. you can smell those from across the garden, oh I don't mind God. that that funny haircut. I guess you would kind of um, equate that with you know where you have the business in the front and the long in the back <laughs> type of haircuts. So yeah, I can see how that could be. Oh, definitely. But I have to say the fragrant ones, that 
that's a real untapped market in the UK as well. People don't realize hostas have got fragrance and it is mm. just, yeah. And like guacamole, uh, Aphrodite, I used to love that lovely double one. Mm-hmm. Whoa. Well, like now I'm, I'm always going to look at those hostas in bloom and think of a mullet and think of you. Oh, <laughs> but what about hostas where red is coming into the foliage? That is interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, Fire Island, I think, has been released recently in the UK, mm-hmm. and I think it won't be long until we have a red leaf hosta. Really, like a, yeah. I can, the veining is beautiful when it yeah. can get it up the stem, but I've not it's... seen it come into the leaf or any pinkiness. But yeah, yeah, once you could get a pink blush, even I think that would be incredible. Yeah, a little bit with Fire Island. Um, I'm always going to Google that at the same time just to check I'm correct. Uh, because cherry berry was one of the first with the red stem, hmm. but Fire Island, you can see it kind of running up a little bit. Mm. Yeah, mostly still in the stem, but with gold foliage. If you can imagine that combo, that's pretty cool. But nice. yeah, so I'm keeping my eye on hostas. <laughs> oh yeah, so more hostas and always more coming. And those collector prices yeah. hopefully will come down a little bit for the for the regular home gardener. Well, we don't, they're not that collectible in UK, so we don't really have that sort of market with hostas. No, oh. sadly. Have you ever been to a hosta collector's or daily collector's auction, Michael? No. <laughs> oh, oh, you have not lived till you've been to one of those auctions. Because really? <laughs> when the prices start going above 150 to 300 really? for just a fan of a daylily, just one oh, fan. Yeah producing one because it is that one that that person wants and and they just go up and up in price it's it's always a fun evening to attend those no this is really uh a brea uh what do you call it uh revelation to me <laughs> <laughs> oh the most we would have actually is uh galantophiles people um, that are obsessed with yeah. snowdrops mm-hmm. they get to maybe a thousand pound ish sometimes yeah yeah yeah, yeah, similar and and probably some of the same people. I'm gonna guess uh, yeah. <laughs> it's probably some of the same people that are. They have to have those early early snowdrops or those unique ones in their garden for the glandophiles, yeah. and then they might be by summertime turning to that. Oh, I have to have that newest daylily. But <laughs> the great thing about all of those in that category is, in a few years, you've made your investment right, and you've probably made it back. So maybe yeah, in, five, in four to five years, you they all hopefully will multiply and you can divide them. Yeah, yeah. But then the price might have gone down by then. Yes. Well, for sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> because obviously with houseplants, there's this kind of thing as well. And there is, there's a, there's a lady in the UK. She, um, she used to work in the city in stocks and shares. And she's now attributing the same kind of practices to houseplants and almost trying to kind of make a houseplant price index a little bit, really. Hmm interesting work she's doing but i'm not i'm not sure what what it's going to lead to i don't know but we'll we'll see keep an eye on her that will be interesting to see because the the market is so variable and people are just guessing a lot of the time and it's what the market will bear right if if the person will pay the price yeah well maybe we'll jump to house plants now so we've done annuals and perennials so let's jump to a few house plants that you're excited about wow (laughs) i really lost myself last week in holland there was uh i was at the trade show the plantarium mm. and there was a supplier there called uh what's it called touch of jungle i think and they had their own hybrids of caladiums oh my gosh they were beautiful so many like color formations you could not even imagine there was one that was kind of gold with a uh, deep blood red almost black center it was crazy cool honestly so these caladiums, amazing as house plants. We we can't grow them outside in UK. So it's a house house plant specimen here. Colocaceas as well. Mm. Someone said to me uh, last week that Pharaoh's mask. They've grown that outdoors in the UK. Huh. So we could be that some colocaceas we could grow outdoors, but that is a really cool looking house plant. Nice for that impact as well. But I'm really, with houseplants, I'm getting bored of all the foliage plants. And that is getting a bit repetitive. I really want to start giving some orchids some love. Because Mm. you've got new Phalaenopsis with fragrance from the Sention series. They're very interesting. There are also a lot of very interesting Kalanchoe as well. You know, some of these species ones, for example. You know, and I, I love to experiment as well. So last February... When there was a double flowered primroses, uh, double flowered primrose trial, 
I had some as kind of an indoor table plant and they're really happy on the windowsill for like about four or five weeks max. So I want to see more flowering house plants, which add that extra dimension, you know. So, yeah. Uh, what's that? But there is one foliage plant that I love at the moment. What is it? Schiz Schismoglottis. This is cool, actually. It's kind of like uh, arrow-shaped foliage with uh, kind of markings and marbling. That That's probably one foliage house plant I'd put up with. <laughs> mm. Yeah, and I think you're you're so on the nose, Michael, about flowering houseplants are yeah. the new big thing. And yeah. I'm seeing violets, African violets coming yes. back. Oh. In, and then I would, of course, love to see a resurgence of, of orchids. I mean, there, of course, I've been to a few orchid yeah. auctions and the plant geeks there are unrivaled <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as, exactly. as far as acquisitiveness. They yeah. have to have, like, if you are into slipper orchids, you have to yeah. have these certain ones. And, and yeah, it gets l really competitive at those. Um, but yeah, I, I would think you know, the reputation of orchids as being a difficult plant mm -hmm. really needs to be addressed more. Yeah, definitely. But what about also, um, I was at Dibley's Nursery in Wales about a month ago, and they've got a lot of African violets. They've got a lot of varieties that are not elsewhere. But also, very interestingly, Achimenes, you know, the hot water plant. Hmm. They've got so many different colors of those. And when we were chatting, they, they will actually grow outside in the summer. And I look at them and the range of colors there are. And it's almost like a, in my eyes, it was almost like a rival to a petunia in some ways. I don't know. I'm always, I'm always wanting to blur these lines. What is a house plant? Can it be a bedding plant? What is a bedding plant? Can it be a house plant? So mm -hmm. I'm always kind of madly trying to blur all of those lines all over the place. But Achimenes was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and also, to be honest, some of those lovely cane begonias, they had one of those uh, with fragrant blooms. I can't remember the species now, but um, but th actually, talk about blurring lines. I don't know if you've seen from Banari, there's a new uh, begonia called Stone Hedge. This is a landscaping begonia with black foliage and white flowers. Oof. I've had it indoors as a houseplant for two months now, and it looks so awesome, I have to say. Yeah. And it's starting to reach up like a cane begonia now, and I really love that look. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been seeing so many new introductions of begonias and, you know, mm. I will say I'm not the biggest begonia fan. I still have to be convinced, I think a little bit. I think it's the shedding uh yeah. the constant shedding of the flowers like as an yeah. outside annual. I'm fine and with it. House plant that is a bit mucky because they're a little bit wet and moist mm -hmm. sometimes. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that is a downside, I must admit. Yeah. So maybe just have like a tray around the plant yeah, <laughs> or something. Yeah. 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 But uh, the new ones they're introducing are amazing. Definitely. Definitely. And because the, the Space Stars series is bringing together probably about 60 different types. That's coming through Beacon Camp in Holland. Wow. And some of those, uh, are, sometimes with these series of plants, they bring in from many different sources. So there's actually, some of those are from Dibley's in Wales. Some are from the US. Uh, some are from Europe as well. But this is kind of changing a begonia, kind of Rex type, into an indoor-outdoor plant, which is quite interesting. Yeah. And here, a lot of the breeding is going to pushing that zone that we were talking yeah. about earlier and trying yeah. to get winter-hardy begonias. And I'm starting mm. to see those for the Mid-Atlantic. In our last few minutes, let's turn mm -hmm. to the woodies, the shrubs and trees. And I know shrubs is such a huge category to have to mm -hmm. ask you to pick out just a few. Well, I've just been at the trade event Plantarium in Holland, and I really, from the moment I walked in, the impression I got, the next big, um, what would you call it? It's kind of like a, a classified as a small tree slash large shrub, Circus. Mm -hmm. And I know you'll know this, the Eastern Red Bud. Oh, yeah. Circus in so many different leaf colors. Eternal Flame won the plant of the year at Chelsea two years ago, but now there's... Uh, Carolina Sweetheart, I think that's the name. It's got this marbled flower, um, marbled leaf and kind of new leaves are kind of like this purple tinge as well. Melon Beauty, which has got this lovely green yellow leaf too. Oh, so many things coming through with Circus and double flowered forms as well. It feels like a real now shrub as well. Um, added to that, I can see there was a lot of development in, uh, development in Budlia over the last few years, but also... 
I think Hebe is about to knock it off its perch because there are some new Hebes from Denmark, namely uh, from Edenda. There's a new variety called Alina, which has a flower almost the size of a Buddleia. It's really, it was really mind blowing, actually. Really, really cool plant. So they were a couple I spotted just in the last couple of weeks, but also at the plantarium, the the new, uh, the best new plant was a Diavilla. It was a Kodiak series from Proven Winners. Now Diavilla are a really interesting plant, like a bush honeysuckle, kind of very useful, kind of just a really good, just a plant that you plant and it just gets big and it just fills the space. But with Beautiful foliage, gorgeous flowers as well. So I'm a big Diavilla fan at the moment, actually. Hmm. Mm. Are they, I kind of find their growth habit a little bit, I don't know, shabby. <laughs> like, yeah. Do you do you prune yours or how do you take care of yours? I, think I probably, I see it as a plant that needs a supporting act in the play <laughs> mm-hmm. so it's a plant that's kind of like a filler you dot it around and it kind of fills in the gaps it kind of stitches other stuff together a little bit so yeah for that um i haven't got any first-hand experience of growing it but i like to get my hands on some of this nice kodiak series soon but it's so good for pollinators as well which is a really good thing mm-hmm. yeah. mm. also hydrangea paniculata i've been working a little bit with living creations the dutch breeding uh, company recently And some of their varieties are really gorgeous. They've got one called Little Rosie, which is comparable to a bedding plant, the way it flowers. It's really, really gorgeous. Flowers for a long time. Obviously, you've got the color change with the seasons on these. Milk and Honey. Milk and Honey? I think that's the name. Milk and Honey is one that almost... uh, You know, some plants are not necessarily fragrant, but the nectar has a kind of scent to it, like, uh, like a dahlia. You almost kind of feel like a dahlia is fragrant sometimes because the nectar is so rich. Hmm. So with the um, uh, hydrangea milk and honey, this has got a real frothy kind of uh, psychological fragrance, I would say. It's really gorgeous. Yeah. Maybe it just looks so lovely. I think it's fragrant. I don't know. <laughs> but it's a really special plant. Mm, that does yeah. sound nice. Yeah. All right. And maybe we'll finish up with an edible or two. Sure. Um, I spent some time recently with a very interesting company called Coppert Cress in Holland. And they, not necessarily things you can grow at home, but they're using sprouting, they're growing sprouting seeds for a lot of the top chefs and for a lot of the kind of very popular restaurants across Europe. And I learned a lot about different different sprouting seeds you can grow at home. So things like Agastache for a sweet sprouter, Stevia as well. But also, uh, what are they calling it? Tap? I think they're calling it Tahoon uh, Cress or Tahoma Cress. But it's basically the seedling of a mahogany tree. So Tuna sinensis. And I don't know if you know, but a young mahogany tree, the leaves, they always say they smell of beef and onion. Huh? And as, as a cress, using mahogany as a cress is beautiful. It tastes beefy. It really has the most full flavor. And and I, I tried some in a cheese sandwich and it brought the whole sandwich to life. I know that sounds absolutely crazy, but it is beautiful. So if you can get your hands on some tuna sinensis seed, try that yourself at home. Also, edible flowers really opened my eyes. Bean flowers, Dolichos, Lab Lab, one mm. of the best ones they grow as an edible flower. Basil as well. They had three-year-old basil plants that were only harvesting the flowers from. Very interesting. Also, jasmine. They were growing jasmine sandback for the flower harvest. And they took me behind the scenes and they showed me the first European crop of vanilla as well. Uh They perfected how to grow vanilla crops. And they, you know, the Dutch, they can turn their hand to any sort of growing. And they, they're confident they now grow it better than it is in, you know, in many kind of plants where it would feel more at home because they got everything right. They they're keeping ahead of the pollination because obviously it's hand pollinated these plants as well. Mm-hmm. They said there was <laughs> there was one morning when there was 8,000 flowers that needed to be pollinated within a four to five hour period. They had to get all the family involved as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but the Dutch are happy to innovate and throw themselves into stuff. And I, I see a lot of that and it really is continually impressive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean... Who wouldn't want to be a vanilla farmer if you could? Because, oh, heaven. <laughs> well, honestly, the crops, though, real, like, I don't know if it's called a panicle or what, but just, uh, well, bunches. 
bunches of beans, almost like you would see runner beans, French beans, string wow. beans. Oh my gosh, honestly, incredible. So that, yeah, they're kind of my edible tips that are not so easy to grow at home. But we have seen a bit of a movement in similar to Heidi Highlands Garden that we visited in Minneapolis mm -hmm. in ed edimentals. And a top designer, Tom Massey, put together a really great garden at Hampton Court this year that included, it's, it seems really simple when I'm saying it out loud, but blueberries in borders mm -hmm. because they've got lovely flowers. They've got lovely autumn color. They've got really pretty crops. Why do we think of fruit plants as something that needs to be in a border, um, in a fruit garden when it can be in a border? Dwarf raspberries, like uh, I think you've got the raspberry shortcake variety there, which is Ruby Beauty in the UK. This is a lovely bushy plant. Use it as a shrub in the border. So what that it has fruit you can eat? Kind of think of it first maybe as a shrub and secondary as an edible plant. And this way we can really shift up our borders and make them a little bit more useful, but also more inventive and more and more fun. I've always wanted to push the categories of any of these plants. That's, mm -hmm. that's my thing, I think. Yeah, <laughs> and, I, and there are so many plants, as you said, with the edible flowers that, you know, we're growing yeah. ornamentally, but you can eat those. <laughs> so, totally, totally, yeah totally. even the tulips may be a little bit pricey for an edible but yeah you can still eat those um so summing up how can our listeners find out more get in contact with you and follow you on social media michael well i think i'm quite easy to find <laughs> <laughs> so mr plant geek is kind of like the moniker that i gave myself when i moved freelance about seven years ago because um it was just a way to sum up what I'm about and also because I was seen as a geek when I was young and that wasn't a positive thing but I thought you know 30 years later I'm going to own it call myself Mr Plant Geek so Mr underscore Plant Geek is where you'll find me on Twitter x and also on Instagram I've also got a comprehensive website mrplantgeek.com I've also recently moved into using Substack as a kind of uh, kind of almost a news platform, which is obviously also sent out as a newsletter as well. So you'll find me there, uh, New Plant News. I might do a rebrand in the autumn on that as well. And yeah, and you'll see me, uh, you might find my book in the UK as well, which is Hortus Curious, published by DK Books. Uh, just came out in Germany, actually, and I've got a copy on my coffee table right now, all in German. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for sharing and owning some of that plant geekiness with us, Michael. No worries. We cannot wait to have some of these additions to our American gardens. And for those listening from other countries, I'm sure they're champing at the bit as well. <laughs> no worries. Thank you for asking me on. It's been really, really fun. Thank you. You love listening to podcasts. Have you considered making your own podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since I discovered Spotify for Podcasters, I found it super easy to produce the Garden DC podcast. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started today. Nine Bark Plant Profile Nine Bark, Physocarpus opolifolius, is a native shrub with beautiful foliage, arching stems, and spirea-like spring flowers. The common name, nine bark, refers to the multiple layers of attractively peeling and shredding bark. It is also called Atlantic, Eastern, or common nine bark. The West Coast native version is the Pacific or tall nine bark, Physocarpus capitatus. Nine bark also has an Asian counterpart, Physocarpus amurensis. 
Ninebark prefers full sun and not to be too crowded as powdery mildew can be an issue. It can tolerate periodic wet soils and is adaptable to a wide variety of growing conditions. It is hardy to USDA zones 3 to 7. It is loved by native bees, butterflies, and other nectar-seeking insects. Birds use the shredding bark for nest material, shelter in the shrub, and also eat the fruit. The cut branches make a great addition to flower arrangements, and the shrub itself is a good replacement for overused invasive exotic shrubs like Nandina or Barberry. Nine Bark is experiencing a breeding boom with many new cultivars being introduced to the market. Michael Durr, in the newest edition of the Manual of Woody Landscape Plants, admits to a change of heart about Physocarpus and now endorses it for its adaptability, multi-season interest, and new generation of colorful cultivars. Diablo, the original groundbreaking purple leaf cultivar, was introduced in 1999. Copertina, Little Devil, Summer Wine, Lady in Red, also known as Ruby Spice, and Amber Jubilee are all great additions to the garden. These cultivars are better suited for most garden conditions. The straight native species needs space to grow. It can easily get to 10 feet by 10 feet. To control it, prune off any suckers that emerge from the surface roots and cut it to the ground annually during winter dormancy. You can also dig out unwanted suckers and pass them along to others. Nine bark roots easily and sends up shoots readily. Note that nine bark is considered deer resistant but not deer proof. Nine bark, you can grow that. What's new in the garden this week? Well, it's the start of the peak of dahlia season. I'm loving my cutting garden. It looks like a veritable florist shop of beautiful colors and shades of different dahlias from small to large, from green leaf to dark leaf. I am just in dahlia heaven. In the local gardening world, some events you might want to attend include the Friends of Brookside Gardens Perennial Fall Plant Sale happening on Saturday, September 9th at Brookside Gardens in Wheaton, Maryland. This event is rain or shine and you can see the plant sale list and details at friendsofbrookside.gardens.org. If you are a member of Friends of Brookside, you get to come in a little bit early and shop from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. and I recommend highly doing so. You can join at the door if you want to. Uh, that same day, the Herb Society of America's Potomac Unit is hosting Connie Hilker, owner of Heartwood Roses and a past guest on the Garden DC podcast for a free presentation about rose conservation. So she'll be speaking at the U.S. National Arboretum and that will be at from 11 a.m. to noon and you can find out more about that on the Herb Society of America's Potomac Unit's Facebook page. And then a couple weeks after that, the Arlington Rose Foundation is hosting a rose show at Merrifield Garden Center in Fair Oaks on Lee Highway in Fairfax, Virginia. You can enter your cut roses or your photos of your roses. So entry and the uh, show itself take place the weekend of Friday, September 22nd through Sunday, September 24th. And hope to see your entries and maybe see you in person there. Happy gardening! Get low maintenance alternative salons with the new book Ground Cover Revolution by Kathy Jets. 
Reducing the lawn is among the biggest trends in home ownership, with an endless stream of homeowners looking for an eco-friendly alternative to a traditional, everyday grass lawn. In the last few years alone, over 23 million American adults converted part of the lawn to a natural landscape, and now are looking to do even more. The biggest challenge to adopting this new ideal of perfect lawn is knowing how and when to replace your turf and which plants are the best ones for the job. Ground Cover Revolution is here with all the answers you need. Included are 40 in-depth profiles of plants that are perfect choices for replacing a grass lawn. There are options for sun, for shade, for dry and wet sites, and for various climates around the globe. There are choices that bloom, options that are evergreen, and selections that are deer resistant. Author Kathy Jens has also included an incredibly useful chart that gives you all the details on each of the 40 choices for quick reference and to make your ground cover selection process even easier. Whether you want to replace the entire lawn or just reduce the amount of land dedicated to turf, Ground Cover Revolution will help you usher in a new and improved idea of what a beautiful lawn should be. Available at bookstores now and also at Quarto.com, where you can get 30% off using discount code GARDENING30. In the new book, The Urban Garden by Kathy Jensen and Terry Spade, you'll find dozens of inspiring and creative ways to grow flowers, shrubs, vegetables, herbs, and other plants in small spaces and with a limited budget. Whether you want to grow on a balcony, rooftop, front stoop, or a tiny urban patio, turn your growing dreams into reality and build a gorgeous and unique garden that showcases your personal style while still being functional and productive. With the ingenious ideas and resourceful tactics found here, you'll be maximizing yields and beauty from every square inch of your space while also making a lush outdoor living area you'll crave spending time in. Whether you're growing edible plants or beautiful flowers, the 101 amazing growing ideas found in the urban garden will turn your tiny urban yard into a treasure trove of green you'll be proud to share with family and friends. Buy your copy today at your local retail bookseller or order it online now at amazon.com or bookshop.org. This is the last word on the joy of apple picking by Christy Page at Food Gardening Network. I woke up the other day to a temperature of 55 degrees with a high for the day of 70. I've been trying to be in denial, but it looks like fall is creeping in. I look at the calendar and see that summer is just ticking away. Pretty soon, I'll be seeing kids at the bus stop, leaves changing colors, and the need to throw in a sweatshirt before stepping outside. It seems that summer's never quite long enough. But even as I say goodbye to picking berries each morning, there's a part of me that is very eager for fall for one big reason. Apples. I do not have any apple trees. I have not even attempted apple trees. I will admit, part of it is because they intimidate me. A big part of it, though, is the experience of going to an apple orchard. I grew up going to the apple orchard every year with my family. It was a big event. My grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins would all join in the fun. We would pick apples, watch them press cider, eat treats, pet animals, and just have a day to never forget. I carried on that tradition with my own girls. I've taken many pictures over the years of them at the apple orchard. Not only would we pick apples, but there would also be the fun of a hayride, a small petting zoo, a pumpkin patch to pick out the perfect jack-o'-lantern, and fresh apple cider donuts. We would tote home our bags of apples and plan our baking for the next few weeks. We had apple coffee cake, apple pies, caramel apples, and so much more. And just when we were about to be all appled out, which really is a thing, we would make the rest into applesauce to be canned and enjoyed all winter long. Many times over the years, I thought about starting a few apple trees. I could then have apples right in my own backyard to enjoy whenever I wanted but I can never follow through. For me, part of the fun of fall is a visit to the apple orchard. My girls are all grown now, but they still enjoy going every year. They may not care so much about the petting zoo or the hayride, but none of us have gotten over our love of a warm apple cider donut with an apple soda. This is a tradition that I am so happy to see live on. I hope it continues for many more years. It may be some time away, but In the future, I see a glimmer of grandkids and a renewed interest in the hayrides and the petting zoo. Until then, it's almost time to dust off all of my fall recipes. As sad as I am to see summer start to fade away, my excitement is building for apples. This is the last word on the joy of apple picking with Christy Page at foodgrinding.com.
Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash garden DC slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.com. Thank you. You can find Washington Gardener online at washingtongardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.